All right, can everyone see that? Great. Yes. All right, and I've, uh, I've gone ahead and turned on the uh, Google Slides uh, audience tools. Uh, feel free, though, to uh, ask questions just uh, during the presentation itself. I just turn this on, uh, especially if people have questions that are uh, maybe more tangential or, or not directly related. Uh, you can ask them through the, the slides, and we can um, kind of address them afterwards. Uh, so, uh, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sumit Shah, a software engineer here at Asymmetric. And today, we're going to be talking about a research project that I did about explainable artificial intelligence. So I recently published and presented my paper, uh, Evaluating Explanations of Convolutional Neural Network Image Classifications at the International Joint Conference on Neural Networks as part of the IEEE World Congress on Computational Intelligence. Um, so yes, uh, we're, we're just going to be kind of going through the contents and, and what I found. Uh, this project touched on a lot of different pieces of both technology and academia. So uh, if there's if I ever slip into jargon, which I'm going to try to avoid to do, sometimes it's unavoidable, though. Uh, yeah, just, just let me know, and I can uh, answer any questions and provide clarifications as needed. So let's, uh, let's, let's dive right in. Uh, as a quick introduction, uh, as the sophistication and complexity of machine learning models increases, we sometimes have lost transparency into exactly how they make decisions. Neural networks are prime examples of models that can achieve high performance on complex problems, but lack interpretability, effectively making the trained models black box systems. So while large neural networks may not be interpretable, that doesn't mean that they are not explainable. Techniques have been developed to generate human interpretable explanations that show which parameters are used for decision making. Given that the quality of an explanation from a human perspective is inherently subjective, uh, historically, the quality of these explanations have been evaluated by human judges. Uh, that being said, for any explanation generation framework, we do need a reliable way to judge and evaluate how good the generated explanations are. Uh, human evaluation may not always be reliable or even viable. Uh, our goal is to demonstrate a method uh, for the automated quantitative evaluation of explanations generated by modern frameworks by examining the explanations from the perspective of the ML models themselves. So uh, we propose a pair of experiments that can be used to evaluate generated explanations for two things, sufficiency and salience. We define an explanation to be sufficient if it contains enough information to be accurately classified on its own, and we define an explanation to be salient if it contains the most important information for representing the class as learned by the model. Explanations are complete if they're both sufficient and salient. Explanations that are sufficient and not salient contain enough information to be correctly classified, but not enough to adequately represent the feature set that the classifier has learned for a given class. And uh, in the other hand, explanations that are salient but not sufficient contain objective representations of a given class, but not representations of the class as learned by the model. Um, lack of either sufficiency or salience would be an, 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 an indicator of an incomplete explanation. We limit the scope of our study to convolutional neural networks and the Lyme uh, explanation framework under the assumption that our experimental design can be adapted to other explanation frameworks and machine learning algorithms. Uh, we'll dive a little more into, into both CNNs and Lyme uh, just in a, a few slides. We say that the framework generates sufficient and salient explanations if explanations perform at least two thirds as well as the original images in their respective tests. We chose two thirds as the threshold for uh, sufficiency or salience, as it's the threshold for a supermajority vote in government terms. But this threshold could kind of be set at any value, depending on how strictly you want to evaluate your explanations. Uh, as a hypothesis for our experiment, we hypothesize that Lyme explanations will exceed the two thirds threshold for sufficiency and salience, and will therefore convey a complete representation of the information used by the model to make classification decisions. So uh, as I mentioned, we, we limited the scope of our experiment to convolutional neural networks. Uh, we selected CNNs because we felt that they were a good example of a complex model capable of achieving high performance that lacks native interpretability. Uh, to really drive that point home, we use the Google Inception v3 framework, uh, which is a 42 layer convolutional neural network structure that's been optimized for image classification and object recognition. Uh, this diagram here is a architecture diagram of the network itself, and as you can see, it is uh, definitely not lacking in complexity. <laughs> uh, so for training and classification, every image was resized to a uniform uh, 299 by 299 pixel square. 
And we had a training process consisting of five 320 step training epochs with 32 samples in each gradient update. Uh, don't worry about that part too much. <laughs> Uh, we will be treating the inception model, though, uh, given its complexity, as a black box. And so we'll be supplying an input image and observing the network's output layer for the classification decisions. But everything that goes on in the middle, we're kind of uh, just leaving up to itself. And earlier, I mentioned the LIME framework that stands for uh, Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations. Uh, this framework gathers data on a model by performing a series of perturbations on the inputs and observing the resulting changes in the outputs. Uh, that data is used to construct a locally faithful linear model that serves as a, a proxy model for the original global model in the feature space, local to the given input that we're attempting to explain. Uh, in, in simpler terms, what that means is that uh, with the inception network, the global model is, is kind of very high dimensional and hard to visualize. Uh, what this will do is, as far as the parameters of one image are concerned, we're going to build a local linear model that helps us make classifications specific to this one given image. Uh, in the context of the image classification problem, the input perturbations that Lime performs take the form of modified input images with occluded sections. The sections of contiguous pixels in an image that you see on this slide are called superpixels. Uh, an explanation consists of the set of superpixels composing an image and their associated weights for each of the possible classes. Uh, based on the description of each superpixel, we can reconstruct an explanation image using the most relevant superpixels. And so in this diagram, which is taken from uh, the paper by uh, Ribeiro, who's the, uh, the original uh, creator of the Lime framework, we can see that you have this original image with um, a dog playing the acoustic guitar and uh, after performing those input perturbations to see which parts of the image are most relevant to the classification, electric guitar, acoustic guitar, and Labrador, it highlights these pieces of the image accordingly. And we use that to reconstruct these, which serve as the explanations. So uh, the data that we used for our experiment were two data sets. Uh, we used a cats and dogs data set consisting of 25,000 cat and dog images and a flower data set consisting of uh, 4,242 images of five different classes of flowers. These data sets were selected to test the efficacy of our framework on classification problems of very different difficulties. With abundant training data, only two classes, and reasonably high interclass variability, the cats and dogs data presents a relatively easy problem. Uh, conversely, with sparse training data, five classes, and a range of inter and intra-class variabilities, the flowers data set presents a more complex multi-class problem. For all of our experiments, uh, which we're going to get into greater detail uh, later, uh, we performed five full stratified cross-validations. The results that we'll be presenting are the results averaged across those five folds. And uh, given that an an explanation contains the set of superpixels composing an image and their associated weights for each of the possible classes. In our experiments, we varied the number of superpixels, n, allowed in an ex explanation image. Explanations with too few superpixels may be incomplete, while explanations with too many may be noisy and less interpretable. And we varied that number, n, from 1 to 25 in, five, uh, in, in increments of 5. So Lime will select up to a maximum of n superpixels that have a positive weight associated with the predicted class, but will select fewer if there are less than n positively weighted superpixels for that class. To, uh, to illustrate what this looks like, um, this slide is showing the effect of varying the number of superpixels allowed in a generated explanation. The image on the right was classified as a dog correctly. Um, and the images on the left are explanations of this classification decision with 1 to 25 superpixels allowed. Uh, we can see that at very low superpixel counts, the explanations can only contain the most key features of the image, in this case, uh, the snout and the eyes, while at high superpixel counts, we start introducing noise. In that, in that last image, you can kind of see that we're now including pieces of that image that really don't have too much to do with the dog itself. So uh, our first experiment is designed to test if the generated explanations contain sufficient information to justify the decisions made by the model. Uh, so first, we trained a convolutional neural network on the image data set, and we refer to this CNN as the primary model. 
the performance of the trained primary model was evaluated against the data from our test set. Next, for every classification made with the primary model, we generated a Lyme explanation for the correct class. The primary CNN was then used to classify the set of generated explanations, uh, meaning that we, we generated these uh, partially occluded images and then fed them back into the primary model to see how well they would be classified. Explanations containing sufficient justification for the classification of their original image should still be classified correctly, as they contain sufficient information. As such, the primary model's classification precision for each class serves as a measure of how sufficient the generated explanations are. We use precision as a measure to highlight how the false positive results are the explanation framework's decision justifications falling short. Depending on the specific goals of your explanation evaluation, arguments could be made for using recall or the F1 score, which is the harmonic score of precision and recall. But that's, uh, that, that would depend on the nature of your study. Uh, the results of this uh, are presented here. As a reminder, these results are averaged across the five folds of our experiment. On the left, we have a confusion matrix of the performance of the primary model on the cats and dogs test set. As we can see, the model is able to perfectly classify every image. Normally, that would actually be suspicious, uh, in that perfect classification usually means that you've overtrained or you're doing something wrong with your experimental design. But given the performance of the inception model on much larger and much more difficult sets, this actually isn't surprising considering how much training data was available and how relatively simple that classification problem is. On the right-hand side, we see the primary model's precision on the generated explanations for each class. So this is how well it was able to classify those partially occluded images, which serve as our explanations. The ability of the primary model to classify the explanations generated from the test data with varying numbers of superpixels is very different between cats and dogs. While Lyme can generate sufficient explanations for cats with only one superpixel, the model struggles to identify dog explanations with fewer superpixels. The model gets better at classifying dog explanations as we increase the amount of information in them. And at the, su at the 15 super pixel mark, they exceed our sufficiency threshold of two thirds, the original image's performance, which is represented by those dotted lines across the plots. The difference in the number of super pixels needed for each class to produce a sufficient explanation is not entirely unexpected. Additional research into uh, canine and feline genealogy has revealed that dogs as a class have much greater in-class variants. Uh, there's far more species of dogs, and they've also had uh, much more time to diverge uh, genetically. Whereas with cats, I believe there's about half as many species, actually even less, less than half, and um, most of them which have arisen in the last hundred years haven't really had any time to diverge genetically. Uh, moving on to the sufficiency results of the flowers data, uh, here we can see the average matrix for the flowers primary model. Unlike the cats and dogs model, which had an abundance of training data uh, to learn just two classes, this model had only 587 instances per class. The primary model does not perform nearly as well, as is to be expected given the limited amount of data available and the difficulty of the classification problem being addressed. The model is able to identify daisies with very high precision, but has relatively low precision for the other four classes. Looking at the primary model on the explanations, we see that the sufficiency of explanations with different numbers of superpixels varies wildly between the five classes. For daisy explanations, we see classification precision climb steadily and exceed the sufficiency threshold as we increase the number of superpixels. But with dandelion and tulip explanations, regardless of the number of superpixels included, they're classified with very low precision and remain below our two-thirds threshold. Rose and sunflower explanations follow similar trends to each other. Precision on low superpixels is relatively poor, but increases significantly as we increase the count. Uh, interestingly, we see that both classes ex have explanations with 25 superpixels classified with greater precision than the original images themselves. This is actually a very positive reflection on the performance of the explanation generation framework. Having a greater precision in the explanations suggests that the explanation framework is filtering out noise in the original images. So to summarize the results of that experiment, uh, based on our results, we have evidence to partially support our original hypothesis that Lyme explanations are sufficient. The results of testing the cats and dogs image explanations show that they contain sufficient information to be classified correctly. The results of testing the flower Im image explanations are less clear cut. 
three out of the five explanations uh, for daisy, roses, and sunflowers uh, achieve sufficient precision relative to the original images, but the other two do not even approach the threshold. It may be possible to increase the rate of sufficiency of these classes' explanations by raising the restriction on the number of superpixels, but doing so could also hamper the human interpretability of those explanations, and that once you're including too many superpixels, you're basically including the whole image and not really narrowing down what it is that the, the model used to make its decisions. The second experiment was meant to test our second parameter, salience. Uh, so here we're testing to see if the explanations contain salient representations of the original images classes. For this experiment, we trained two new convolutional neural networks. The first one, which we refer to as the secondary model, was trained using the original test images for which we generated Lyme explanations in the sufficiency experiment. Uh, another network, which we refer to as the EX model, or explanation model, was trained using the Lyme-generated explanations themselves. The performances of both models were evaluated using the primary model's training data as the test data, and if the EX model is able to perform as well as the secondary model, it would mean that the explanations generated by Lyme contain a, a reasonably salient set of information and indicate that the proxy models constructed by Lyme are faithful to the original model. The salience of information transferred to the explanation models via Lyme explanations is observable through their ability to differentiate classes. In this case, because precision and recall have equal weight in this test, we use the F1 score, which is the harmonic mean of precision and recall, as a measure of salience. Now, I know that that was a bit of a long explanation and uh, a little roundabout and confusing, but the basic premise of this experiment is if, um, if person A knows math, and they teach person B math, then you have person B teach person C math. You can use person C's um, understanding of math to judge how well person A taught person B. <laughs> um, anyways, moving on. <laughs> um, the results of this experiment are, are presented here. On the left, we see the performance of the secondary model on the cats and dogs images. The model actually performs uh, very well, achieving a 97% F1 score for both cats and dogs. And this is very competitive with the primary model in the first experiment's 100% F1 score. This is impressive, considering that the secondary model had only one-fifth the number of training examples as that primary model. The plots on the right show us that um, these explanation, uh, the models trained using explanations uh, ability to classify cats and dogs once again, and we can see that the one superpixel EX model performs poorly for both cats and dogs. However, once we increase the uh, superpixel count used to train these models up to five even, the performance increases significantly and crosses our threshold. Uh, we see that the EX model trained with just five superpixels is competitive with the secondary model, indicating that five superpixel explanations contain enough salient uh, enough of a salient class representation of the cats and dogs. Uh, now this confusion matrix shows the results of the flowers data set secondary model. And this model actually performs pretty well, achieving similar F1 scores as the primary model for daisies, sunflowers, and tulips. The secondary model has learned roses slightly better than the primary model and dandelions slightly worse. Uh, as with cats and dogs, the secondary model had only one-fifth of the amount of training data as the primary model. However, it should be noted that 20% for cats and dogs was still thousands of images, while for this data set, 20% amounts to just, uh, just under 150 images. These results show that the secondary model has learned to differentiate between flower classes just as well as the primary model. Uh, here we see the performance of all of the flowers EX models. Uh, we see a mix of behaviors among the five classes of flowers. For daisies, we can see that the one superpixel EX model has the lowest F1 score at 50%, while the secondary model itself has an F1 score of 60%, with the other EX models scoring somewhere within that range. The EX models are able to classify daisies almost as well as the secondary model, indicating that even one super explanation, one superpixel explanation model uh, explanations contain most of the salient information to represent the class of daisies. Uh, a manual examination revealed that one superpixel daisy explanations mostly focus on the segments of the images containing the pistol and some of the petals, highlighting the shape and color. Uh, the F1 score trends of the EX models for dandelions, roses, and tulips resemble logarithmic curves similar to those observed for cats and dogs. 
Now, the performance of the EX models on these sunflower images is very unusual. Uh, increasing the number of super pixels past five in the EX models causes a significant drop in performance. The models have not learned to identify the sunflower class well, meaning that the explanations used to train them were not at all salient. This is very surprising, as the explanations of the sunflower images containing five or more super pixels were mostly sufficient. Uh, the EX models are misclassifying sunflower images mostly as daisies, and a visual inspection of the generated explanations used to train these models shows that this misclassification is likely caused by similar pistol coloration and petal shape. Since the secondary model performs much better, it appears that the information being transferred to the EX models uh, regarding sunflowers is not salient, which is making the explanations largely incomplete. To summarize all of that, <laughs> the results of both experiments on both data sets indicate that the Lyme framework has the potential to generate explanations that are sufficient, salient, and sometimes both. Explanations can be sufficient, justifying the decisions made by the original classifier without being salient, and explanations can also be salient and represent the class well, but be insufficient as they do not represent the full set of information for the class as learned by the classification model. These results provide conditional support for our hypothesis that the Lyme framework is capable of generating sufficient and salient explanations, with the condition being that the complexity of the explanations must be adequate to capture the complexity of the classes being described. More importantly, while prior work describes high-level taxonomies for classifying types of explainers and ideas for evaluating them, in our experiments, we've been able to implement concrete evaluation methods for generated explanations. Moving forward, we would actually like to refine this evaluation framework and test a greater number of explanation frameworks uh, and machine learning models. In addition, we'd like to experiment with larger and more complex data sets. Uh, computational resources were definitely a bit of a bottleneck in this research. So moving forward, uh, we would like to work with larger and more varied data sets. While uh, at the beginning I did say that human evaluation is not always reliable, it doesn't change the fact that the quality of a human interpretable explanation is something that must be determined by humans. As such, uh, we would like to run a parallel tests to see if humans and our framework agree on the sufficiency and salience of generated explanations. Uh, and uh, just to wrap things up, we do hope that as the field of explainable machine learning continues to expand, that our methods will serve as a basis for automating the assessment of the quality of generated explanations and be extended to a broad range of machine learning problems and models. Thank you all so much for coming and for listening. Um, any questions? That was really cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for doing this to me. You're awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. It is so, my pleasure. Um, I have a question. Do you think you could use this framework to evaluate the model itself in addition to the explanation? Yeah. Well, so you definitely can. One of the applications of this type of explanation, hold on. I'm going to, if I hit stop, that won't kick me out of the meeting, right? It'll just bring my face up. <laughs> Yay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so one of, one of the uh, applications of this type of framework is also to try and find, uh, especially the weak points of your own application as it goes. Uh, I don't remember the author offhand, but one of the, a paper was published about facial recognition about um, one pixel attacks, where the premise was that you can have a thing that can recognize images or faces very clearly, and they were able to develop a model that could take an image of a face and find out, find one pixel in it, and change that pixel and break the whole classifier. Um, and so then you kind of do that in an adversarial sense and that now you can go back and generate explanations of those misclassified images to figure out what your model is doing wrong. And then you can use that to adjust and tune your model to be better. I don't know if that, did I, was that kind of what you were asking or? <laughs> yeah, sort of, um, thanks. But that's a really cool way to test um, the explanations. Yeah, it, it may not, if I'm remembering your question right, it was if you can use it to evaluate the, the, the model itself. Uh, I think I ended up answering a different question. The, the answer to that first one may actually be kind of no, in that the, the idea behind a lot of these explanation frameworks is that they are meant to be completely agnostic to your model itself. Okay. So if the, if the explanation generated is bad, but your model is still performing very well, uh, that that doesn't mean that your model is not good. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> what you would, I think, want to do is look at the explanations to see if they're focusing on the right pieces. Uh, a, a, another case study that came up with the Lime framework was that they had a classifier that was, I don't know in what context they were doing this, but they were recognizing pictures of horses. Uh, but then after using uh, an explanation generation framework on it, they realized that the model wasn't actually picking up pictures of horses. It was picture picking up the watermark on stock images that they got of horses. <laughs> um, so you you can use it to, to evaluate your model, but that's, um, that would be kind of outside the scope of the framework that I've made. And that if if my framework says your your explanations aren't sufficient or salient, that's not a reflection of your model. But you can right. definitely use the explanation frameworks to tune and improve your model. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Very nice job, Samit. Thanks for pulling this together. Oh, thank you. It's great to present. I'm glad so many people came. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, oh, another thing that I, I don't know that I mentioned, um, if, uh, oh, is there something in the chat? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> if um, if anyone does want uh, access to that that paper, uh, I know we put it up on Jostle internally, but I, I know we have some people who are, are coming from outside. Um, but go ahead and, and uh, uh, email me. Uh, my, my email address is uh, sshaw at asymmetric.com. I'll stick it in the uh, chat right here. Uh, it will be published in the in the World Congress on Computational Intelligence Proceedings, but I have no idea when that's actually getting published. Um, so I can just send you a copy right away if you'd like it. It's about it's the abbreviated version, so it's down to eight pages instead of like twenty four. Uh, but I think that's definitely an improvement because. <laughs> well. Um, if no one has any questions, uh, we can wrap up. I don't want to keep you all just sitting here <laughs> staring at me, but. Uh, <laughs> no, we appreciate it, Sumi. Yeah, I would like to ask one simple question. How computationally expensive is it to run in the Lime frame, to run something through the Lime framework? And how hard is it to set that up? Uh, so it's. So we it's, already have a computation pipeline. How hard would it be to tack on that evaluation through the Lime to get the explanations? It would not, I don't think it would actually be, it's, it's not particularly difficult. Um, what's nice about the Lime framework is that it, uh, also it, it kind of makes, it makes it very easy to use. If you go on, I can send you a link to their, um, their GitHub. It's, it's very quick to set up and get going. Uh, the computational complexity for me just came from, for, for one of those image classifications, uh, it takes about five minutes to, and, and you can also make this quicker or slower depending on how intense you want Lime to go at it. You can customize all of the, the hyperparameters. So you can choose how many perturbations it does, the, the number of super pixels, um, not just that you're going to allow, but also how fine grained they are in terms of the image's size. Um, but each, each individual one took about five minutes to generate, but that's also just like kind of on my local machine on the kind of uh, lower performance uh, AWS things that I'd spun up. But five minutes per image for 20,000 images repeated five times really added up. And I think that ended up being, and that was for, for just one of the experiments for the other ones. Uh, for the second experiment, it was, it was that multiplicatively again. Uh, but if you were to do it using um, any, of the, any of the, if you do it using the, the GPU version of TensorFlow and give it a bit more resources to play with, uh, I'm, it would be pretty performant Five minutes was on my kind of more not fancy hardware. <laughs> uh, so with uh, actual resources in AWS, uh, you could probably go pretty quick. Thank you. Yep. And um, if anybody is uh, interested in, in trying to set up something like Lime themselves, um, let me look it up real quick, actually. Uh, the, the, the GitHub account for um, Lime presents a, a pretty good tutorial as well as they've got a little uh, video really just giving you a, a three minute overview of Lime itself. And they give previews on how to apply it not just to image classification, but they also provide a language with, um, I think, sentiment detection and natural language processing and documentations for their API. This one is uh, entirely in Python. Uh, so if you are trying to integrate it into a non-Python project, uh, 
I guess, take that into account. But the way that I set this up myself was just having uh, kind of individual floating containers where I send it an image or in whatever the data that you'd want to classify is, it does its thing and it just drops its uh, explanation into uh, an AWS bucket and you can pick it up from there and, and do whatever uh, follow-on processing you need. Yep, and uh, if, if you guys are also interested in other uh, fields of explainable AI, uh, Lime is just one of, of many explainers. Uh, there's another one uh, that's very comparative to Lime called SHAP, which is the Shapley Additive Explanation Framework. That one has to do, it's based off of the concept of Shapley values, which I believe are a principle that originates in game theory, but they're kind of an additive function of how much the actions of each player influences the outcome of the game. In the context of, uh, of classification, it's how much each individual input does that. But it also takes into account not just their presence, but the order in which they do things and how they're arranged relative to each other. Uh, that one is more computationally complex just because Lime will, I don't want to say wing it, but it, it, it stops at a certain point when it comes to poking the input to see what the output does. Uh, the Shapley framework is completely exhaustive. Uh, the nice part about that is that that also makes it idempotent in that every time you do it, you'll get the same result. Uh, with Lime, you can run the same image through it uh, multiple times and get slightly different explanations every time. There's also um, ones that are a little uh, less uh, obvious in terms of how their explanations work, like layer-wise relevance propagation. But that one is, uh, I think, maybe actually more in line, Kara, with what you were looking for. Um, I Maybe, maybe not. That one works by basically taking the inputs and propagating them backwards through the model to try and explain. If you, if you know that an input gets you an output, and from that output, you can figure out what the inputs were, it uh, it gives you a bit more insight into, into how the model is actually working without forcing you to fully recreate the structure of the model itself. Yeah. Well, um, any questions or? Oh, someone's cat. <laughs> well, once again, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's been great presenting to you. See you, Samit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>